So I will start with one question. Uh, we saw this uh, uh, BWFLA uh, emulation as a service, uh, and uh, uh, um, we see that it relies a lot on uh, the people that are uh, doing the emulators, like, such as Shipshaver of, or Basilix. And I haven't been on the forum of Shipshaver for uh, many years, but I was wondering if you are in contact with like the two or three developers that were working on that, or if you know if you keep up of uh, of their uh, motivation to continue to work on it, or if they know what you're doing with their emulators or not. Just a short note, no, we don't. We don't have contact to them. Uh, we forked the, the project on GitHub. We have our own patches applied, but only what we've needed. I think the Geoffrey has a bit more contact. I, I haven't had contact recently. Um, I guess it's been about three, three or four years ago. There's some things I added for the hybrid disks and for VHDs, which are a way of doing uh, sort of on-demand uh, disks, I guess is the best way to describe the way I used it. And I, and I offered those in and they, they made some corrections you know, the, for stylistic things for their style and checked it in, but I don't get the impression that there's any there there right now. Uh, it, it's very difficult to compile now and uh, there don't seem to be any, uh, anybody really fixing it. So I think at this point, the best way to view it is uh, it's, it's done in the sense of support from the original people and whatever has to happen going forward, probably some rework needs to happen from the preservation community. Yes. Okay, uh, yes. Um, well, I was also in contact with uh, the sheep shaver communities two or three years ago, and uh, well, th this is really one of the problem with uh, all these emulators being written by uh, uh, amateurs, uh, hackers, or beasts. Uh, it's very informal. Uh, they uh, born and then they die, uh, and then we, we might be stuck. Uh, and uh, because, for instance, uh, a lot of uh, this environment, uh, emulation and so on, use the, this emulator as a core application. And uh, uh, we see that uh, there is a, sometimes there will, there's problems will happen. Uh, and uh, for many of these emulators, uh, they can emulate uh, 95% but there is this 5% that they cannot emulate. And these 5%, of course, are the most difficult bugs. Uh, and so, so that's something that uh, maybe oh, we can um, work with these communities without uh, destroying their uh, the dynamic ecology. Uh, I don't know how to do that. Your fundamental premise is wrong. The emulators are, in fact, much more formalized. There are there was a rich ecosystem in the 90s. Uh, then it kind of started to go under a few. Then it broke apart again. Um, right now, sometimes people write emulator cores that each others use. Those are heavily refined. Neil Bradley's 6502 emulator, for instance, is just very simply the chip, and it's integrated into a whole pile. So sometimes what you see is like, oh, someone wrote an emulator. What they really did was they put a wrapper around two or three other extant write, uh, routines that have been hardcore tested. Um, MAME has never had a downtime um, from its early days. Um, I just witnessed two major things that they just did. Number one, they are moving away from the main commercial license, which was a bad idea, and it was done in anger because a vendor in 1999 tried to sell a MAME arcade machine and called it MAME, and MAME got very angry about that, so they made a kind of mutant BSD license that was, uh, please don't, you know, you can't sell it, but it didn't keep up with the times. They are now converting to a full GPL compatible chain. Uh, similarly, they moved from an internal SVN server to GitHub, 
And so now in public, I am watching between, I would not be remiss to say between 100 and 150 bugs fixed every month and somewhere between five and 10 new machines added each month and several dozen features added each month. So while we're here, I've been watching them increase it. So to me, the emulator ecosystem is very strong. Um, when we go after one or two, I mean, certainly I know I'll speak for BWFLA that they do the same thing I do, which is ensure that the hooks don't depend on any single entity so that if it turns out somebody's better, they get, they get dropped, the new one gets replaced, that there's no wrapped in piece. So for us, we found that currently, um, the, the DOS box mscript import works better than the um, main IBM port, just for now. The IBM port is getting stronger. They've been now goaded by this to work harder on it. But there's all of this going on. I mean, one of, I mean, I'm way in there, all up in the, all of these different communities, and I'm not always liked, and sometimes I am very liked, but I play a part in them because I represent one of the possible end games they claimed they were up to, which was museums will touch this, archives will touch this. I don't take full credit for this, but I am one of the things they can point to to go, look, here's a legitimate use for us. Um, so, so it works out pretty well. I mean, some of them think I'm bringing too much light and heat. I understand that. And some of them don't like my sometimes layman oriented descriptions of what they do because it's a rather complicated art. But I think that we're really selling emulators short if we try to indicate when you say, for instance, well, there's 5% they don't do, mm, give them a week. Um, the Apple II can now emulate, uh, the Apple II emulator within MAME can now emulate printers and export them as JPEGs. So at some point this year, when I feel like getting another million users, I'll make print shop work again so you can export out J JPEGs of banners. That'll get news. Um, similarly, they've added connections for, um, I'm trying to think of the most obscure thing that they've done recently, um, you know, where you might say, well, this is never gonna happen and they've done it. Like there's great incentive now to do it. Like the, the eco, the, the, the the circuit's closed. You can work on something and know that it will play on a million boxes within the year, whereas before you satisfied only yourself. So I think that we're going to see that engine faster and faster as time goes on. I just, I just want to add to, to Jason's comment, also on the Jason's presentation. Well, there are now three frameworks, more or less, which enable users to use or to embed emulation, like it's, it's the Internet Archive and it's Olive and it's us. And as he correctly noted, we, are, we, we don't fight each other uh, because they're different approaches. <laughs> yeah. But what we, what we do is, or what all of us do is that uh, make a demand or create a demand for emulation uh, which is important also for another, it's, it's not only encouraging the emulation community and also maybe uh, provide some funding to fix bugs or to fix this two or three percent because it's a legitimate cause. But it also will put some pressure on the, on the copyright thing because once there is a demand, before, before these things happened, there was no demand for old software or it was just, well, invisible. Now it gets visible, and now people think there, there, there is a use of old software. So we, I'm pretty sure we will find a way in the next five or ten years to deal with this issue, also with the, with the sustainability of, of software, of emulation, because there are use cases which are more than just uh, kids playing console games or some, or, or some, but there are some really good use cases for that. Any questions from anybody? Yeah. Um, 
I was wondering how you deal with um, stuff that runs uh, based um, relies on APIs, because that's something that's changing really rapidly, and uh, more and more work is relying on uh, different types of APIs that are around. Uh, and I noticed that many of these works are going down, especially when they are based on uh, Google API. So is that something that is uh, keeping you busy, or is being worked on? I always got an answer for everything. So when you're using APIs in this context, do you mean items that rely on external organizations or networked connections or cloud or services? Exactly. Okay, so one of the things that's happening right now is the tragedy that we are turning into a rapidly homogenized system. That is to say, when you're like, oh, APIs, you really mean Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, and about two others. There's others, but they die. I'll tell you that the average social network dies within about two years. Uh, Ello and I have gone back and forth about this because the day they announced they were around, I showed up to say, so what are you going to do when you shut down? And I had a great conversation on, on the phone with one of them. And so really we're just, you know, we're, we've long ago gone to McDonald's processed chicken when it comes to there. So really there's only one target, which is Facebook, because Facebook will absorb everything else. So. Uh, I've been focusing my volunteers on just every single potential collection of software that rips through Facebook because Facebook is where it all is. It's like Facebook is basically Windows now. So in that way, um, we're looking forward. Um, when you look backwards and you go to these weird proprietary systems, the technology that people are using to correlate and figure out what happened, um, there's, there's a variety of approaches which are working, um, and I don't want to get stupidly technical. There was a Nintendo 64 emulator that came out, and it was called Ultra HLE, and it broke everyone's brain because it was 200K, and it perfectly emulated Nintendo 64 about two years after the Nintendo 64 came out at full frame rate. And everyone was like, well, this is secret magic by the Stasi, how was this created? And it turned out that what it was, was it was watching what the ROM wanted and then said, oh, you want a triangle there. Well, I'm just gonna draw a triangle there. I'm not even gonna figure out like how this works. So instead of focusing on understanding Nintendo 64 as an entity, it did this thing where it just said, oh, you want this, I'm gonna give you this. And that advancement can be used over and over again. It's what DOSBox does, which is, what do, you, what do you want? And then sort of try to make it accurate as possible, but it's actually feeding back. We're seeing these advancements in going through schematics, in being able to analyze what comes in and out of a chip, what goes down a wire. So we're doing that with little black boxes on network. So to me, there's, to me, there's, um, inherent amount of education about that. People have moved from let's write an operating system to let's write a thing that analyzes ongoing computer processes. So I'm, I'm bullish, I'm, I'm positive. Um, I, I think there are other ways to answer the question. Um, but I don't, I don't think Jason has uh, teenagers because my teenagers don't use Facebook, but okay. Um, so he's, if he's bullish on Facebook being around in a decade, I'm... Oh, no, no. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm just bullish that everyone's there. You're telling me they're not, but whatever they're on is going to die in two years and they'll end up back on whatever the dominant uh, and it, is. You know, Not to debate it. So APIs can mean a couple other things. Uh, one is, uh, what do you do about things that depend upon an environment not, that's not self-contained? That might be one way of interpreting APIs. I think that's a real problem, and you already, we already talked about it earlier in terms of some of the art that was discussed, things that depended on, say, on Twitter feeds for their behavior, those sorts of things. The best you can hope for there is if you have an object you want to preserve that depends upon interacting with an environment over which you have no control is to develop a, a model of that environment, a behavioral model of that environment. For, for example, something that depends on Twitter feeds, you'd have to provide a synthetic Twitter feed if you wanted to capture the behavior. There's no real other choice because you can expect the environment is going to go away. It is going to be a different environment, if it's not Facebook, something else. Uh, another way to talk about APIs is in terms of things like, what was mentioned earlier, things like uh, apps for the uh, iPhone ecosystem. That's really problematic because you have actually 
no control over that box. And I don't, I'm not as sanguine about emulation other than the development tools that Apple provides for the iPhone to suggest that you could then take an iPhone app, the code, and port it sometime in the future without a lot of, a lot of effort. It depends on quite a few things you have no control over. So emulation uh, has worked really well. What I hope for for the future is not that we don't need emulation of the whole platform, that in fact we have more abstract uh, interfaces for the software and then we, can, we don't have to go down to the low level hardware in order to capture the behavior. I, just a final comment to this. Well, the, 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 it's a relevant problem also for research data. Uh, well, we have, we have a project with, um, with scientists, they depend on, on finance data from Reuters. So that's, that's simply data. Here you can assume, even for, also for Twitter, that there are archives, alternative archives, for financial data, for Twitter feeds, for whatever you, YouTube videos, um, which may be available. So our point, or our simple answer is, is emulation. So what we are thinking about is broadening the scope of emulation. That's so you don't emulate a system, but you emulate an, um, connections to an API. So you emulate data structures and, and um, Archives. So, so that's what actually Dr. Dagan and Olya do uh, with their GeoCities. So, it, through the, through the, through a proxy magic, what uh, Dragon has done, GeoCity is working again. So, all the original URLs are, are working again. So, there are approaches, but well, it, it get, it's getting difficult, or it's getting more difficult. Yeah. Mm. It was fantastically educational to have when Drake and Olia crash landed into my life because they um, took data that I had worked with a team to acquire, which was GeoCities, under relatively duress situations that we agreed that we would never go under again. So when archive team goes after a service, we really go after a service now, and we really do all these things that were mistakes before. But they were doing they did operations as if I had been dead for 50 years. Although once in a while they would try to ask me something. And it enabled me to go, what will people want? And I got it within two years. And it fed back immediately into the archive team's work because then we said, wow, how are we gonna be able to handle someone like what these two people are doing? Look at all this work they're doing to undo this mistake. Let's do this. And so as a result, the technology now is, I mean, it's, it's weapons grade in terms of how intense it is. It's able to like figure out that it's connected to video or connected to a forum and, and make decisions about URLs. And that comes from people making use of the material first. Um, I have other opinions about the, the whole idea of like, would emulate the e ecosystem, but I will summarize it as none of this is new in terms of problems. Like how do you simulate a 16th century village? You know, I sat in on an emulated Shakespearean play on Broadway with Stephen Fry, and they did it as if it was then. They put a court on stage, and when we came into the theater, that theater had the actors all there getting ready as if they were visiting actors, and there were people who were royal, uh, guests and they made all of the costumes using only the materials that were available at the time of Shakespeare and they did this whole schmeal because to and it was emulation and you could go yeah and over here are all these artificial lights and over here is you know nobody's got um, black death it seems to be a pretty good day and 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 so on and you could pick apart everything they got wrong in the emulation and marvel at the parts that they got right and I think that's just what's going to be. I, I, I mentioned, what was it, that in 50 years, kids today can make money uh, showing up on emulated um, first-person shooters mm -hmm. and have them act like when they were 15 to other people who are playing, so just sit there insulting everyone's parentage while playing so that they could have the experience of what it was like back then. It'll be great. Lots of job opportunities. Anything about it? it uh, no, I'm thinking about something. Okay. <laughs> Maybe it's interesting to <laughs> to others Do it. Uh, as well. No, I was thinking about two things. Uh, one is, uh, it was a question maybe to you, if it's in general in your community and community of people who make 
work with emulators. How is it seen? Uh, is it uh, will it be perpetual process? Uh, will there always be drops to emulate something, or once uh, uh, hardware and software industry will adjust to the standards, that uh, sort of uh, the emulation will be, not the emulation, but the software will be at least software will be produced in a way that it's not getting obsolete, or in, that there is a so to say for the future that they create themselves. Yeah. Every software has in its. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you understand what I mean? Not yeah. Well, so I, so I have, so the Internet Archive has about a million Android apps that we had some p people just they've been dredging the the Google Store, the Google Play Store for a few years now, and they have all co all copies of all public apps, and I could put up an Android emulator in JavaScript tomorrow, like I could, like we have it, and I'm just not doing it because it will break things like it's the companies don't like it when you're the first match for their product and you don't sell their product you have a version of their product so I'm like all right well I'll, I'll wait for Android to die and then we'll have this it's already here like to develop Android apps they made their own Android emulator mm -hmm. because it was easy and I can already port it to JavaScript so the emulator is now waiting for history to finish so it can get on with remembering it. So we're already there. Um, when JavaScript or WebAssembly, which is JavaScript's um, legitimate descendant, occurs, um, and it can handle virtual, once it emulates VMs, which it will in a browser, that's pretty much game over for a lot of situations, you know, because then you can have the emulator running the VM that's running the emulator. So I, I, don't, I, th I think we're ahead of the game in many ways, and I think that this move towards the cloud has caused homogenization, that word again, of the computing experience, where it's just a machine and you ask for the machine. And there's some people out there doing work. I mean, did you see these? Uh, there's a test company out there, and you can list one of 1,000 different OS variations, and then you can and, and and how it will look on the browser, and it'll just run it, and then send you back a thousand screenshots of your own site. So people are doing this independent of us, just for business. So some poor sap for like six months had to go out and figure out how to keep track of all these variations and screens and everything and make it all work. He's not, whoever that is, has never once talked to any of us. You know, just had to do it. So there's my positivity again. It's that endless happiness. Good. I, I have just a short answer. Uh, yes, emulation will be perpetual, because not because I need a job, but uh, well, we have a lot of new gadgets coming up, like iPhone, whatever. Um, there is always the emulator before the, the, the physical device, because you cannot sell a physical device without software. And you, you need an emulator, which you provide to software vendors, um, so, they, so they can write software, which is ready for your device release. Otherwise, you, you will have an empty device. What, no one will buy an empty device if there is no Tetris or whatever Super Mario <laughs> running on Mario. it. Uh, no Mario, one will, Mario is forever. No, no one will buy it. And the second thing is why we still probably will ever, ever, ever have obsolete software and obsolete, uh, and will need emulation at, at some point. Um, if you take a look back, a lot of things have changed how we interact with devices, and I think this will change in the future too. So. We don't use command lines anymore. Always some people use it, but uh, most of them, most of the people use no touch screens. And I don't know what we use in five or 10 years or our kids will use. So at some point you have to translate this to or the old technology to the current technology. And even if it's just input, the input model or the, the, the interaction model with, with this technology, maybe it's, you use whatever, I don't know. My the imagination new, is limited on that side. <laughs> the new version of VR doesn't turn the suck out. That might be yeah. kind of interesting to watch. So, yeah. Actually, one problem with emulation, especially if you go back five or 10 years, is remembering how to drive. You know, you can put up a perfect uh, environment from 15 years ago 
uh, I had this problem with DOS emulation that I couldn't remember the DOS commands. Imagine that. I used to know them so well. But, uh, so that gets to be a problem. If the input device has changed significantly, the way you interact, uh, somebody was mentioning that it's difficult to do uh, the hover on a touchpad because, well, there's no mouse to hover. You're either touching it or you're not touching it, but there's no in-between. So there's some difficulties with that. And just one last little thought on emulation. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that the Macintosh was an emulator for at least a decade. Um, the original Macintosh had 68,000 in instruction sets, and all the code was written 68,000. And when they came out with the PowerPC, what they actually did is have a 68,000 emulator in there. And the ROMs and all the code were still 68,000 code. And then there were some native apps that came along. But really, the last decade of the classic Mac was an all emulation decade. Um, mm -hmm. So it's not. Instruction set emulation isn't hard. Actually, much harder is things like high-speed graphics, accelerators, and things like that, the custom hardware that many of the later game machines use. That's, that's way harder to emulate than just the instruction set, so the basic I.O. Somebody had a question up there. There we go. <coughs> she was right here. She's right here. Oh, he's looking for the thing. Somehow I know. OK, so earlier. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You, see, to me, are the experts of, on home pages. And so I'm asking you now, uh, expert on home pages, uh, the history and of the web page of, uh, made by people, just normal people. Not like the things that are being collected uh, every day, but just my normal people. Do you think that uh, it's possible that, I mean, there is no reason why people can't make their own web pages today, but they just choose not to for one reason or another. Why do you think this is? Just a brief statement about that. And then also, do you think that there is a chance or that it's even de desirable uh, for people to find this sort of creativity again? Um, do you think that's important or even interesting uh, at this point in time? Uh, I think it's uh, extremely, mm, <laughs> would be extremely, yeah, that would be my dream, yeah, <laughs> if people would uh, start to make home pages uh, again. But it was exactly, it's uh, just not happening. I also see it uh, uh, around me, whatever, I'm very convincing when I'm uh, showing to students all the beauty and <laughs> of the earlier web pages. And uh, I already think uh, I have people who, um, under uh, who understand, uh, uh, they sort of can also feel it, and uh, they can restore pages. They understand the beauty of the aesthetics or some very essential things, so we can talk about them, but they don't have any need to make a home page for themselves. So it's just... Uh, it's just completely yeah, over. It's just easy. I mean, it was always easy, is the thing. <laughs> but no one. Yeah, but I think it's uh, such a conscious and such a beautiful activity, and uh, so many issues that we have now with the, also with the. Uh, privacy and with media literacy, let's say they would be solved if uh, if if this would have wouldn't have been seen as a, a short period in the history that people made web pages. Yeah, it's sort of completely. Well, on the other hand, you still have sort of like you still have artists who make pages, but it's seen as sort of a specialist activity in that in that light. Huh? I mean, and that's a little weird, isn't it? <laughs> anyway. Yeah, there is a web art. <laughs> yeah. You can also open it full screen. <laughs> it's really just a home page, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. You want to say something about home pages? About Tilda Club. Uh, did, I, did I get you on Tilda Club? I must have gotten you on Tilda Club. No. I'm on Tilda, on Tilda Club. The, the stellar writer, Paul Ford, uh, tried an experiment a while ago, and it was called Tilda Club, and it's tilda.club, and it's basically a Unix machine that he gave some accounts to people, and it's running Unix, and it's a Unix machine, as if, it, you know, I mean, it's been security upgraded, but it's got, uh, you can do wall, you can finger, you can connect to whatever tilde user account and 
he doesn't include, you know, whatever, he, it's whatever people are making of it. And so I have Pac-Man running on my homepage and, and other people are running, like I run this thing. And it's this interesting attempt to say, let's take a step back. And it's running as if it's a 1996 machine. It gives you just enough tools for you to figure out what you're doing and people are living in it. And then they're, they got a little chat channel and they're all talking and they're all little buddies because they're all on Tilda Club and everyone knows Paul and he's our link, our random link, that I, I think we'll see more and more. There probably are some that we don't know about and that kind of return to like, all right, let's turn the heat down. Not everybody's page has to be a million dollar experience. And so I, I, and I mean, from that, that's why I'm constantly digitizing or bringing onto archive.org all that old source material, old HTML guides and old programs and old manuals and old everything because I'm like people will want that again That's the hope or they'll they'll say this is fun um, I mean, I'll give you a, a weird Very quick and I'll shut up which is so there's an undocumented feature with the browser um, we were getting a lot of complaints because people would boot up an, a, a role-playing game or a long-playing game. They would save their game in our emulator in a browser, then close their browser, come back the next day or the next week, try to load their game, and it wasn't there. That was outside of the realm of their knowledge. A person would go, well, of course it wasn't there, but they were like, where's the game? So we fixed that. We have a persistent file system in a cookie. And so there are people who are playing for months on end. I see them playing role-playing games and they're booting up their computer, which is located inside of a browser window, loading up their character and continuing to play. So their experience is this weird thing that shouldn't exist and it is. And so um, I guess I'm just saying that, you know, People are finding their home in there. I get all these 1980s questions, like, what are the keys to dig the apple panic? What, I can't figure, there's one where the review, the, the, the review is, I can't get it to work on my machine, will be one person, and the other person will say like, why is it only, you know, why am I only being attacked by red team when I'm playing on this? Why isn't it blue team? And, and their, their, their experiences are hugely variant. So it's, it's very exciting to me to watch that history come back. And these people, the lawyer who sent me the Pac-Man cease and desist was four years younger than Pac-Man, right? It's a whole new generation of people who are dealing with these things from all points of view. And they don't have that context. Like Oli is bringing back people for whom there's no time you couldn't touch a television and have it go, hi, thanks for touching me. Let me tell you some things. And they are finding value and meaning and building themselves through it. That's the magic to me. So anyway, that's the, built, that's the built-in magic. And she is a magician, a sorceress. You spend too much time in San Francisco. You all the time say magic. It's true. Yeah. It's true. I try to stay in San Francisco as little as possible, but I have to go there every once in a while. Oh my God. Yeah. I, there must be somebody who wants to ask a question of the other three and not hear me talk. There we go. Or maybe we're done. Yeah, yeah. I had actually one remark on that. You, you keep talking about um, um, that, you know, uh, revisiting history and, and, and bringing back those old things, but. I think the period of the home pages that was the future, and after that we went back into history towards a sort of a broadcasting mass cult mass culture, mainframe computing is back, all that. So we sort of lost the future, I think. Yeah, I'll go big. I'll go big picture on that. Um, what what's going on there though, is you are experiencing the different sets of technology and deriving a conclusion. And I, on, even though I have my own opinions and things I like, um, all I'm working for, which I think should be my duty, is to enable you to have the ability, right is not a good word here, to have the ability to make that conclusion, which is that 
you're able to experience and show someone like this is what home pages were like like you can go to her page and see these glorious old pages come alive again and go this is what it was like and i have a thought about that i think this was the future i think we've regressed as opposed to you know i, I keep going back to what my boss says which was when you take away the past you live in an ever persistent present that allows people to define both what the past and the future are and that as long as you're able to access, access the past and reference it, then you're able to say, you know, you can write that 400 paragraph think piece in medium about this and be able to do it. Whereas before you wouldn't, you would have to say, well, it was older then, but now I can't really show you, but it was better. I promise you it was different. And she's produced tens of thousands of illustrations of what that was. Uh, which I've used extensively and others have used. You did a breakdown of borders as a designation of the art aspect of old home pages, which we've lost. Like it's gone. We don't put borders on web pages anymore. But you broke down not just that there were borders, you showed the border market that existed for a short period of time. You broke down how borders were approached, everything. You know, like that, that wouldn't exist unless we were pulling from that primary source material. I thought that was brilliant. It just works down to I think you're brilliant. Do you get tired of my compliments? They come from a real place. And processing your compliments. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Who else was going to talk about the border? We're going to lose that. I love it. Anyway. So, so if I, like I said, the big picture to me is I want to increase the primary source knowledge for people to then come up with ideas. And they can either talk to me or ignore me completely. I try to make it that all the technology, you meet me and you're like, wow, he's weird. Okay, whatever. And then like, you don't use an operating system and you don't have to deal with the person who made it. You work with it. If you have a screwdriver, you don't have to know about the personality or the weird political opinions of the person who made the screwdriver. And so making these tools and making them available, people can build their own worlds and not be subject to, like Facebook constantly pushes you towards things, its ethics, and they're inherent in the system and you can see them just crushing you on every side. And so, and how they think about you. And so I like it when tools are just dropped open source and someone goes, this is for education, this is for games, this is for proving history was worse, this is for proving history was better. Anyway. You take it. You're great. Done? Are we done? No more comments or questions? So I think when we when we come across the, the field of emulation and the field of then working with the material so not the, which is the combination of the artifact plus the environment and all in its place. And we have been also, uh, some talking points that always come up in such uh, gatherings is the, what is, what is the thing that we actually want, actually want? What is what we need to conceptualize of an artifact or of a environment and what are the significant properties? And um, while I'm, I'm not so much interested in that uh, on a, I don't know, on a, on a level of working. I would just like to hear from the system conservation people that work in emulation and from the people that are uh, working with, with the actual artifacts, what you are thinking about this, uh, about significant properties in general and how how they work for you or how you ignore them or what is in general your, your attitude toward this discussion? Should I give my attitude? Do it. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's, uh, it, this is not uh, the, uh, the, the situation with emulators, it must be actually watched closely what is happening. Uh, I think the environments that are produced, at least for me, they are too perfect. Uh, like how I, the experience I have now with the pages, with the old pages, looking at the, through the emulator, they, I see that they are much better than what I had uh, 20 years ago. 
And this is, I don't know how to deal with this, but I think it's a bit worrying. <laughs> I can tell you, because I always have something. I always have an answer, don't I? So there's an entire set of filters um, on MAME that have been built in. We don't use them at the moment because they're a little bit heavy on the processor that emulate not just the idea of a CRT, but emulate specific models. So it'll emulate an RCA television or a Sony Trinitron, and it will redo the patterns. It will also add damage, it will add line noise, it will add a variety of flaws into the, the printing. Um, similarly, there is a routine that just got added about two months ago that takes a set of pre-formatted WAV files, just because that's easier for now, and will emulate the different sounds that the disk drive makes as it does reads. So it'll do a chunk or a word depending on what it's being used on, and I've seen demo video of that. So the nice thing about software is that as we get better at understanding what those significant properties are, the route to adding it becomes relatively simple. And also, once you do it, people go, you did it wrong, and they build a framework that's even more, you know, like when someone first did this, it did a CRT-like um, emulation. And then other people said, that's, that's crazy. It's gotta, you gotta do it for real. And they went out and they figured out the exact red, blue, green dot patterns of Trinitrons and RCAs and, and created them. So they iterated in software. And then it, because of our framework of constant updates, it got better. And then I was able to compile it into Inscripten. And we find it slows the system down too much right now. So I don't tend to run it, but it's sitting there waiting. But I encourage, before we couldn't even dream of going after those sort of things. Um, and then there's the entire other line of like, well, I mean, it's not a real, com not a real experience unless you're holding a thing that clicks or, you know, unless you're holding a mouse that does this. And the emulators that I work with try to have support for hardware versions so that if you were to build a mouse with a serial, you could actually wire it into mess and it would work. Like it would work with an old one. And it actually takes in the magnetic fluctuations of a disk drive head. So all the routines are converting them to the fluctuations of a magnetic drive head. So in theory, you could hook up something that does magnetic reads, give it the magnetic resonance image, and have it know what to do with it and boot off it. That's what you do when you have too much free time and you like emulating. So I, I keep sounding like an, a utopian whatever, but it's just, that's why I backed this horse why I backed emulation, because I would see this ability to refine and build and collaborate, and I've never been disappointed. I mean, some people are cranky, but they're all cranky. But it's, 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 a, it's, it's a great gig. It's a great gig. And now we see artists creating stuff, running it in emulators, running it in the regular machine, and saying, okay, so here's what's different about my art, and it works this way in here, and works this way in there, and they, they deal with it. I think that's the way to go. What you got, Klaus? Well, the, well, this discussion about significant properties. Well, that's that's. Uh, well, I don't like the term because it's it's from a different time. Um, and if you if you want to stick with the term, um, the properties move downwards on the technical stack from the object down to the technology as. Jason just pointed out, um, because the, the, the object itself, it's immutable. So it's the properties of the machine that matters now, or the properties of the emulators, if they can, if they can um, reinstate certain features of the software part, and if they can make them, make them uh, life again. So Patricia, I think, also has a They do have, so when I think of significant properties or work defining properties, I'm thinking, okay, how is this going to look like in the gallery? And, you know, what is it going to look like on this graphics card or on that? And where is that? So I think you briefly mentioned this issue on emulating um, graphic processing, which I think is in that direction. So I was hoping to hear from you on that. And also, ideas on how you can 
understand if you are getting a result of your emulation um, that it's compatible with what your artist intended, basically. <laughs> so uh, the bottom line is where there's a will, there's a way. But uh, Jason's got a community, the game community, that is uh, uniquely enthusiastic about uh, making these things work the way they did. Um, and you can either have uh, some real enthusiasts who are willing to put a ton of time into it or a lot of money. Either one will do, but if you really want fidelity in a physical sense, it's going to be one or, one or the other or both of those things. It doesn't, it's not that it's technically possible or not possible. It's really a question of where the resources come from, whether they come from spending money and hiring people to do it, or you've got an enthusiastic bunch of amateurs who will put an infinite amount of time into making it happen. Yeah. I agree with him with the small twist of what's nice is that as time goes on in software, and this is a property unique to software, is that in the progress of fixing a problem, in many software cases, especially if it's difficult, you build a series of tools that are then dropped in and people use them in ways you didn't expect. Uh, I keep going to computer stuff and that's different than what you're talking about, but in, for instance, um, people will write routines that will do electrical testing that then replace testing equipment, which therefore can return values against an emulated machine to produce information. And that tool they wrote has its own function beyond that. So it might suddenly be used in simulation of future products or something, and in doing so, both get refined for its new use and get better at its old use. And this kind of stuff happens throughout it. Whereas with a lot of other projects, it might be we want to build a dam. Either everyone in the village realizes they have to build the dam or they'll drown, or the government comes in and says, we're building a dam because it's really expensive to bury all these bodies. And that setup with very few exceptions, doesn't end up with something that can be reused in other dams. A little bit, but not really. Like a few of the tools could probably travel, but like the refinements they made to make it easier to build that dam, they can't just lift them up and make a hundred copies and say, how is it for you, ideally. My metaphor falls apart, but don't fall into it. Um, but with software, it's very fast. Like somebody can pick up another piece and so, what you end up with is what I always say to people. People wonder how I'm, I lead an army of hundreds of people to do things for me for free. And the reason why is because I'm always clear in what my mission is. I do not use the mission for something that nobody will benefit from but me or my small group. That is to say the people benefit from their own work in it. And I encourage uh, action over scope building. As soon as someone discusses scope, I run over them like a locomotive because people use scope as a tool to slow processes down because they want the first little Neil Armstrong onto their visualized moon to make a perfect step without asphyxiating. And I'm like, no, 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 throw like a thousand Neil Armstrongs in. And, and I, I don't like when somebody, like I made a file formats wiki and I said, big fight, big fight in the thing is like, how are we gonna keep track of all the old file formats? And I said, let's make a wiki, let's make it public domain, everything in it, describe as much, link as we can. And a bunch of people have been doing it. We now link to 31,000 documents and programs regarding file formats. But there were people who came in and said, why are you doing that? You should only do this amount. Or I'm not comfortable unless there's a full taxonomy in place. And I just drove them out because they're just, trying to create another little weird kingdom instead of realizing the mission of let's just give this away and fix this problem because everybody will benefit. Writers and every, like, I'm, and, and I'll, you'll hear me talking in these big words again because I'm like, all of culture uh, benefits from open file format knowledge. So we should do this. And so a few people stepped in and have been working on it and others have helped them. That's how you do it. So if you have something where you're like, I work in art, and this is a problem. Here is what the problem I see. Here's how you could help with the problem. People will help. 
But if you're like, I'm not happy with the way things are, hooty hoo, and take another drink, and there's no clear movement, people don't know what to do. They're like, I want to help you. Do I give money to your museum? Do I talk about you? What do I do? And you're like, there are like 10 people who are possibly good at this. Do you know who they might be? And find them for me. And a person goes, I will help you. And they might drop off and so on. But without that clear, open mission, that's what drives people. And over time, there are people that want problems that are hard. They get bored. And you say, here's one. I bet you can't solve it. And they'll go, show me. And they'll step in because the challenge matters to them. And you find them. And that's, so that's like, it's, you know, unfortunately, against my greatest dreams and wishes, I became a manager. And that's where I am now. So it's management. It's not, he's right. We're, we're a pretty good species. We get, we get shit done if we focus. We do pretty good. Yeah, pretty good. Okay. Uh, we have to close the, the Q&A. It was great. Thank you. Uh, super great. Um, congratulations. You made it through. And <laughs>